Welcome to the Internet Chess Club. Checkmate. Okay, welcome everyone to uh, part two of my Smith Moore lecture series. Um, as you know, part one was released very recently. I'm happy everyone enjoyed the lecture. Um, I hope that part two and part three will be just as successful. Part two and part three will definitely be more on an advanced level. Part one was more like introduction to, you know, the little some of the little tricks Smith Moore has and the main ideas basically. While part two, we're gonna lose part two, especially part three. We're gonna look at some of my games and some of the more tricky variations with some good traps. Uh, so anyway, what did we learn in part one? Basically, we learned that the main squares we have to eye on are c7, f7, and when black castles, h7. So e4, c5, d4, takes, c3, takes, takes, takes. We learned that also we often want to play e5 because that really controls our center, uh, gets the pawn on his territory and gives us a good advantage. So therefore, we want to, every time we have an opportunity to play e5, we want to try our best to play e5. We can either play e5 right away or wait for this little nice variation, bishop c4, and now black can't really prevent e5 because as we know after d6, what should white play? e5. Definitely e5 because now white wins the game. If knight moves, we have e6, and if black takes, we take. And then we have a strong position as we went over in part 1. <coughs> so if you're interested in learning it again, go back to part 1. So anyway, let's say black doesn't develop the knight right away and plays more safe. d6 first, and now what do you think is one of the safest moves in this position? Now we know what is the problem after knight of 6, e5, and if black takes, what does white play? Knight b5, so therefore if black tries to stop knight b5 at any point, it's always a logical move because that's one of the more annoying moves in this gambit for towards black. So you want to definitely stop knight b5 or prevent it the fast as you can. And also you want to block the f7 square. So the logical moves could be a6 and e6. Two best moves because as I said g6, bishop g4 and knight f6 don't work well for their own reasons. So let's start with a6 first. What do you think white should play here? Now the way you want to look at the smith Mora gambit is you play e5 every time you have an opportunity to and you only want to see how come you can't play e5 instead of Instead of saying, you know, you want to always start with the belief that you can always play e5 and then just see if in this position it works. So you always want to check right away if you have e5 because it very often works. So e5 still looks like a loose pawn, but let's check it out, see if it's good. Stop sign of 6 gets the pawn into his territory. So what can black play? Well, first of all, the safe move here is just e6, because it avoids me taking and then you have a weak isolated pawn on d6. So e6, then you're able to develop the bishop, and now you're threatening the e5 pawn, because then, you know, you're just guarding all the squares, all the important squares. And now, basically, white kind of has to take, and after takes, 
we need to a key move which we'll learn later in this part in the Smith Mora. And now White just tries to gain an advantage. They have well placed pieces. They'll later play bishop d3 to fire pressure on f7 h7, as I said before. And White just White just has a good game because you know even though they're down a pawn but they have a lot of pressure. This bishop is going to be very hard to develop. H7 square could be weak later on. And this is right for white. This is down a pawn, but a good compensation. And we'll look at a line very similar to this line later on. So let's say black plays a6, e5, and takes. Well, obviously, we know that we cannot take with the knight, so do the knight for obvious reasons. Winning the queen. So, queen takes. And now, if king takes in this position, we can play knight g5. And then if knight h6, which takes f7. Very strong position. Much better activity and much better place pieces. Here we can even sacrifice the rook. Because here we're almost close to mating. Maybe not necessarily the mating, but it's it's very good. For example, check. King c7, knight d5, knight b6, threatening this. It's very good. Maybe not necessarily this move order, but the idea is similar. Or you can just take back the knight and then start all the pressure. Still very strong. And threatening mate. And there's pretty much no defense. B6 I just take and then I mate. So there are a lot of different ideas here where you just have to look for the best tactic to get the good game. So anyway, the main line is knight takes d8. Now, it looks as if white only has takes back because they have no knight b5. And it looks like white doesn't have much anymore. However, the key notice is black did play a6. However, black did not play knight f6. Well, what does that mean? What do you think is the best move here for white? can find it. Well, we have a6, the b5 square is occupied, and we want to somehow get to c7, right? Or maybe even b6, if we can. Because now this square is also weak, which is very, very key in this opening. And knight f6 is not played, so therefore, the best move is Knight d5. And now all of a sudden black's in trouble. Threatening this. The only way to defend this here. Now knight b6. The only move. And now knight takes c5. Now black can play g6 or knight f6. Now it looks like Black defends well. However, White has extremely powerful move here. Extremely powerful move. Which, I don't even believe that in some books it was not even noted, that move. And it was said that this line is fine for Black. However, here, I guess I found a novelty in one quick tournament. Um, and a lot of people didn't know about it. And it was very nice to discover that interesting trap in the Smith Mora in this line, the studied line already. It's not obvious at all, but when you see it, it does become more or less obvious. You notice Rook on b8 is dead, it doesn't have any moves. The bishop on c8 is also very bad, it doesn't have much moves. And Black King is not castled. And that's the formula for success here. 
notice that rook, since it has no moves, if you end up trapping it, you win the whole rook. You don't just win the exchange, but you win the whole rook. That means, even if you sacrifice something to get that rook, it's going to be profitable, right? Therefore, and also, think of how can you attack that rook. Well, c6, d7, all don't work. So the only way you can see is from f4. Well, that means the inclination is to get rid of that knight somehow and play bishop f4. So the first inclination might be, but then the bishop frees the road for the rook, and then that's fine. So unfortunately, we just don't quite have enough, and now black's fine. They have two bishops, they have upper pawn. Also, if we try this, true, that gives black double pawns, but black just saves and develops, and they're upper pawn. So that's good for black. However, white has such a powerful move here that black can black loses automatically after it. Let's take a look. Now, at first you might seem wow, sacrificing a piece out of nowhere for no reason with queens traded. But we see that if he takes. White's winning. Game's over. This rook is struck, and black can't do anything to get back anything. Best try is d7. Probably the best move in this position. But then we take, and now we can't go back because knight b6, and we win another bishop. So, it doesn't help us because now we lose two pieces instead of a rook, which is much worse. So we have to give up the rook. And now white's up an exchange and for no compensation at all. So that's excellent. Up an exchange. Absolutely winning. And to be honest, a lot of people in my chess career has have fallen for this trap. In big tournaments and small tournaments over ICC a lot. It's a very helpful trap trick to remember. Some people also play g6, but that still doesn't help. And basically, knight f6, the first time I noticed this trick is in a 30 minute game I played in a small tournament against, two, uh, against an expert. And I was thinking, well, maybe it's not as powerful. I don't know, it's, I didn't study it well yet. But then as I played it more in ICC, against good players and so more success I realized it's a real deal knight takes f7 and it's very hard to defend it a lot of people can try doing f6 or knight d8 they don't help they still keep the game's lost for example knight d8 threatening this <coughs> now we're threatening this also Now we can play this, and white has a, a big initiative. For example, if they take, knight takes back, attacking the rook, trapping the rook. White's threatening knight takes f7, taking the rook. It's just very cramped, as everyone sees. Here we also pretty much win quickly. So it's just, it's just a matter of finding the best move, and you can even play here. I mean, you, you can win an exchange no matter how you go about it. And, you know, rook d1 and takes is threatening, so it's just very good for white. Uh, by the way, knight of 6 one person played it in the World Open in 2005. I had two IM norms, and I needed to win this last round game to get my third IM norm, and I won it pretty quickly. Even though he did not take, he played knight d4. But later on, I still won the game, because obviously I'm off too much material. 
he tried some things to be active, and I almost blew the game, but I still came out on top because I just had too much material to work with. I was at, at that time up a rook. But he had some activity, but now I'm sure I would not make the mistakes I made in that game. Also, and that got me my third IM norm, so that was a really good feeling to do that with a bit more trap, which was, which is not a famous trap, which is something that is kind of a novelty by me. And then also one person, also a master, tried up six in an over the board game, and I made a mistake. I played knight takes c8, and then knight d4. I was better, but black still had some kind of game going on. But I should have just played knight of 7 Sorry, take the rook. I see, it's even better. Even though black got a back a pawn, it's still... The pawn blocks the knight from developing it. Black has a worse development, so... Had I just played knight of 7 it would be just even much better. So, I actually... had an easier win in that game. So basically, this line is very powerful and I think it's important to analyze it quickly over again. So it starts with the standard move up to bishop c4. Black plays a6. Black could play e6 to be solid, which is good, but d takes e5, we realize that black's in trouble. Takes, knight, 95 since standard of 6, knight still on g8, and now 96, knight b6, occupying the other available square, and threatening knight takes f7 and bishop f4 with no defense. Absolutely over. So, as we see, this is a very tricky line, which is very important to understand. Let's go over now another good line for white. Let's say black plays e6. Now this looks very solid. Black's f7, black's c7. Both pawns blocking. And that's one of the standard ways of blocking the smith more. As everyone sees, right? But now, white has a good move. As I said, we'll look back at that queen e2 idea. Here it comes. Queen e2. Why queen e2? Well, that's because we want to free that square for the rook on d1 in the future. Preferably the rook from h to come to d1. And then, how come we want to do that? To try to play e5. Because with the queen on d1, we can't really play e5 anymore. Since black played e6, we can't do it because if we know that both b5 and d5 are blocked, we can't really play e5 anymore, right? So now we're gonna try to take advantage of the queen that can be possibly pinned. Now, in the future we'll look at how black defends extremely well in the game, in this opening, in part 3. And But now, we'll look at some good ways of white taking advantage of this line. Knight of six, knights before bishops. Bishop f4, very strong move, very strong move. White's threatening rook d1, rook d1, followed by e5. Or bishop takes d6 and e5. Now that might think, randomly you might think, that just loses the tempo. Well, True, if black white moves away, black plays bishop e7. But white has a very powerful move here with knight g5. And now black's in trouble. Threatening this, sacrificing the bishop to win a rook, and it's very good for white. White, black, black has some kind of defense after this. But black needs to find this, and this is still pretty good for white, because later on, you know, you 
pressure on that D6 square, and white is pretty active in this position. So, even though white black still has something, but it's not easy to find. And also, you know, it's still okay for white. It's still pretty good. As I said, you know, this might not be an easy move to play because of this, but this is actually good for black. So therefore, you want to play here. So let's say black plays here. Immediately rook d1. Otherwise black plays e5, and that's it. Then castle, and then black safe. See that the important thing is that whenever black plays e5, without, both, without at least one of these pieces developed, without both of these pieces developed, I mean, then black's in trouble because if only the bishop is developed, queen d3 is usually there, and if just the knight is developed, knight g5. So, that's a very tricky line. So here we play rook d1, threaten here, and then threaten e5. And if the queen moves somewhere, bishop takes d6. And if the queen moves here, we play e5. Or you can play knight b5. If you're playing a good player, you can make a draw here. Uh, if you're playing someone a little weaker than yourself, you can play here, threatening here, threatening here. And this is pretty good for white too. Everyone sees this. D6 pawn very hard to defend, and also bishop takes f6 and e5. White just has an initiative. That's what it is. For example, knight d8, you could even take play e5, have all sorts of things here going on, in your favor. Um, so, sometimes they play a6, but a6 is also bad because of e5. Threatening this, and if this, we play here, followed by this, moving away the bishop, trapping the knight. So, e6, another possible line is threatening e5, threatening knight b5, a6, because if e5 we go here, then we'll try to take here, knight b5, white has a pretty good game, so therefore, a6, e5, if not h5, takes, takes, and white has a pretty good game with that pawn on c7, putting a lot of pressure towards black, really limiting the play that black has. And if, if takes, we have very similar position to the one we analyzed before with e6, with a6, e6 played, that line, white has all the pieces looking at the king and h7 square, this bishop is very bad, and now white just has a very strong game after this, keeping the, the bishop still out there, try to play here, here, and really threaten mate, and you really have all your pieces playing, and black doesn't have any piece in the game, so, that's basically a simple difference, and why it's just much better here, because they have all their pieces in the game. So that's basically the... <coughs> so that's basically one of the solid lines black can play. One of the most solid, and yet still, black is in trouble here. Okay, now let's look at a little bit at the e6 line a little more in depth. White plays bishop f4 as we saw before because we're trying to go for c7. 
Now, let me ask a question. What if black plays d6 now? What's her best move? e5 is an interesting try, but e5 doesn't work as well, because remember, the knight's still on g8, it, the idea is called on g6, and after black plays c5, the pawn is in good shape, it's actually a pass pawn now, and now black develops fine, and white's not really better. Therefore, we play bishop c4, now if knight of 6, as we saw, saw before, queen e2, it just transposes, 5, 9, g5, threatening rook d1. And if e5, just bishop e3, quiet move. And now black's in trouble because of this, we play here. And of this, we play here. So really, there is nothing that black can do trying to develop to free away from that square because both pieces are still undeveloped. And of this, we definitely play here. So therefore, a6. And now, white plays a solid move, e5. And e5 involves one of the best games I've played. It's actually not in a really big tournament, it's a team tournament, Amateur East. It was this February. I, I played against a very strong young master called named Alex Burnett, um, and I'll show you the game uh, very soon, like, after I go over a little bit of decline variations. And basically, I'm gonna show how important the fact that these squares are, you know, are weakened a little bit because of the line that black played, and I'll show you how to deal with this line very effectively. As we see, that black pawn can develop and that bishop is going to have a lot of hard time in that, in that game. Not the king side, but the queen side. And that's pretty important. Okay. So, before we go to that game, let's look a little bit at the decline variations. Let's say black plays here. As I said before, in part 1, white plays c4. And now, you want to be careful. As soon as black plays d6, trying to play here later on, you do not play this because then black plays here, and black's idea is to try to control these squares, d4 and e5, the central squares, and black wants to get rid of that c8 bishop. It's not the strong bishop in this line because it's, it's locked in by our own pawns, or by white pawns. So therefore, black wants to get rid of them to try to control these squares, and there's really nothing white can do much about it later on. And then black's fine. Black's equal. So white wants to play h3. Very key move in this line. And then knight f6, knight c3, g6. b3, solid move, just to make sure you protect the queen side and enable yourself to play rook c1, and also at the same time enable yourself to defend c4. And now we can play here, here, we can play here, and white's doing well, very well. Now, I might have, might have went a little fast, but basically this is the position you want to occupy, similar to morality. Obviously, you want to be careful with playing h3 on time, playing c4 on time, playing b3 and not fall for those queen takes b2 traps, or stuff like that, or with the bishop pressuring on b2. You don't want to fall for that, but if you just play carefully and play patiently, and then wait for appropriate time to play e5 later on. That's uh, one of the strong ideas in this opening. White's much better. It's just that you have to be patient in this line. That's one of the key here. Patience. And basically, in the other lines, d5, knight c6, similar lines.
And now black has a few lines. Knight of six, best line for white. Then white plays here, d5, and white gets a great advantage. Here we just play here. White has a very strong game. Black basically doesn't have any pieces developed except for that knight. And black will have a hard time because that pawn on d5. Again, in black's territory, really squeezes black in. So white's much better here. Maybe three, maybe later on. If bishop g4, we can just play safe, bishop b2, and then play knight c3. And white has a pretty good game. e5, we play here. And then, at first I thought knight e5 is the best line, but then white kind of has a good game after that. Black has a pretty decent game after this. I didn't really see anything that good for white here. So I discovered this move. It's probably better, because if knight takes, we just play here. Winning that knight. And if knight of 6, we can play here. d5. Play here. And we have a good advantage. We're following, trying to play bishop b5, which takes f6, and really stop him from castling. And even though black took that pawn, White's still much better because they have a big initiative here. So this, again, these lines are more complicated than this, but again, this is about how much you really need to know, and then the rest is about practicing a lot. And basically, these are one of the main lines, and if, and if Black tries to play Knight of six, that's the most annoying move, in my opinion, because that transposes into this line, which is quite even for black. So if they happen to play knight of six, you just play five, and the rest of the line will analyze in part three of the lecture, since it is more advanced and it's kind of one separate thing that you have to learn. And we'll go over some games there as well, including my loss against Nakamura that we'll see in the third lecture. Okay, so back to my game against Alex Burnett, to this variation. a6, stopping knight b5. So he, of course, he's a master, he won't fall for knight e7, knight b5. By the way, quite, quite frankly, in that same tournament, someone did play knight e7, and then after knight b5, I won like this. And that was in the same tournament. So I felt that was pretty interesting to share with you. So anyway, a6, e5, now knight e7, of course, developing the knight. Trying to come to g6, pressure on e5. Logical. I play bishop d3. Why bishop d3? Because the e6 move usually blocks that f7 square. So therefore, we're preparing that black castles. And then white will pressure on h7. Now, black might think that they can play d5 here. Not really. Takes, takes. Threatening here. Followed by bishop takes, and then white wins the pawn. And they have a pretty formidable position after that. So Alex played... Um, queen b6. Now, queen b6 might have been not one of the best moves in this position. The idea is clear. Try to pressure on b2 and try to trade off the, the knights. Try to trade as much as possible to develop knights and the other pawn. But unfortunately, that move makes black make too much queen moves, and then that follows being a disaster. Also, interesting note is that one other very strong player salvages versus um, an international master uh, played this in a quick game against me b5 and also white felt uncomfortable black felt uncomfortable after h4 and h5 and white kind of had a very strong attack there even though he played well but um, it's just the attack was too strong and probably just the line choice was not good 
So basically, the best way to set challenges is probably this should be four Trump like queen a five, and get rid of that dame on c three because that knight really is a real monster later on because of because of its possibility to come on e four d d six and it's it gets all over the place as we'll see later on. So it's good to trade it, weaken the c three pawn maybe, and then just try to play safe, defend maybe castles and f five. So that could be safe, but. He didn't play that, he played queen b6. And now, I play queen e2. Pretty logical move. Defending. Knight d4. Here. What do you think white should play here in this position? White has a lot of interesting moves. The move that stands out to you, to a lot of you probably, is rook d1, right? Because you're trying to put up an immediate threat and that knight on g6 and makes the queen move and looks good for white. However, that doesn't stop the threat of knight f4, which is originally what black wants to do. That's why they wanted the queen here to trade as much as possible. And the rook d1 doesn't really do anything. And then after that, the rook kind of is misplaced there because really, what does the rook on d1 do there? It doesn't do much anymore. The key is. You want the rook later on on c1 and the other rook on d1 because that puts a lot more pressure. And then we have a lot of these good squares to look for. And the rook on c1 is the one that has to be there. Therefore, castle is the move. And that's what I played. I know that in this line, I'm not going for this line anymore because after this, just plays this, it's really nothing all that much anymore. The idea of h4 is kind of to kick that knight around. But in this position, castle is the best move. And now he did play here. Because otherwise, rook fd1. For example, bishop b7, rook fd1, knight f4, queen g4. Winning. So, knight f4 takes. And now, g3. Simply testing the queen, seeing where it goes, and seeing, you know, what white can do later on. And also, a backup idea is f4, f5. Not a backup, but another idea. Also, white tries to pressure black. And another key is, of course, as I said before, challenging the queen. And now black makes a mistake. Possibly a decisive mistake. He plays definitely to just defend the king's side, without realizing that his queen side is the one that's in real danger. So queen d4 or queen b4 would probably be better, but still, of course, white's better. They still put a lot of pressure, a lot of pressure. But it still would be better, because at least black would probably be able to develop d6, bishop d7. That will be better for black than what he played. Queen g5 would also be fine because he would be able to play queen d8. But he played queen h6. And now white makes a very powerful move here. Which is me. Um, what do I think is the best move here? Well, we know that the kingside attack is not going to be as effective because black really made sure that it's pretty well defended. But unfortunately for him, that bishop is still undeveloped. And black has that very weak piece of square. And now white makes a very powerful move, knight a4. And now black's in big trouble. Big trouble. If he plays rook b8, queen c2, threatening this, winning. If he plays b5, wins the game. All, all wins. So b5 was unavailable for him. And he has to defend b6 because then I'm, I'm trying to play rook ac1 and knight b6. Actually, knight b6 and then rook ac1. He could have maybe played here. Try to defend this way. 
That would be better probably than what he did. I would still have a good advantage. But would not be as devastating for black. He played queen g5. Trying to get, get all the way back to d8 to defend the, 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 the bishop on c8. So basically black realizes his mistake and realizes that he has to go back. And now, another good move. Obviously you don't want to trade that bishop. Trade that knight for that bishop because the knight is a warrior and the bishop is very bad. So queen e3, getting the queen in the game. Now probably the only move that saves black is maybe. But still, white, black's pieces are really cramped up, so this is probably still winning for, for, for white. For example, this we can take, play here. White's absolutely winning because that bishop is not a bishop anymore. It's, it's a big pawn. He played bishop b4, and now white wins by force, pretty much. Queen d4. The idea was bishop. A, the idea was bishop a5, but now white makes. Why well, make a very strong move here? The game's over. I now win an exchange, and with that, black's problems don't get any better. He took like this, and he cast him, but it doesn't make it any better. Played queen d6 all the way back to completely stop the activity of that bishop. Now I can't do anything. I'm threatening rook takes c8 and queen takes b6. This doesn't help. His only move. Trying to play b5. I play rook c2. He plays b5. I do not let him play bishop b7. What's my best move? Bishop b4. Completely. Completely crush. Okay, so one the next move. He doesn't have any he can't defend the bishop anymore. F5. Last gasp. Just trying to do something. I could have easily took this, but I just don't want to give him anything. And I just found a nice force variation. That's winning. I played here. Takes. If he takes bishop takes f2, that doesn't really do anything. I just make king g2. Has to take, and now I take, and he resigned in this position because of rook c1 check, king g2, bishop c5, only move to defend mate, check, queen f7, d6, and white's absolutely winning. So basically. The idea behind this game was b6 square, uh, the fact that black wasn't able to that bishop, develop that bishop because black concentrated too much on the king side to try to defend that because of some pressure I set there. But the fact of the matter is that b6 should have been better defended and he should have had an opportunity to try to play d5 and get that bishop out because as Tarish said before, uh, one bad piece means one the whole position is bad, and basically that's what happened here. Because of one bad piece on c8, he just couldn't do anything. He was just he could he didn't have a good game the whole game, and that's basically what it was. So important thing in Smith more is that you can win a lot of games positionally, not just by crushing or tactics, but the fact of the matter is you just have to be patient, look for the right ideas. I just look for what's available out there. If you see that the king side is pretty well defended, you look for other plans to try to win the game and put pressure on him, not just try to make him, not play too aggressively, but actually play patiently, aggressively, especially in the decline lines or in the lines you don't have quick mate. You know, you just have to play patiently and take whatever is available and you'll still get a lot of wins like this one. And this one was a very good game, I think. One of the best I played uh, the whole um, year and it really shows that Smith Moore is still a very good opening as long as you take advantage of it very well of all like little mistakes black has. Um, basically um, 
this game is also found in my library, game 35, I believe, and um, also Chess Life, I believe it's the main Chess Life, that game is also there published with analysis, so for anyone who wants to see that game and the analysis again, either listen to part 2 again, or you can also look at Chess Life, the main, the main Chess Life version, or my library. So this game became pretty popular, but uh, probably a good reason for it is that, you know, it's just that I didn't win by mate, straight mate, it's meant more, but I just took advantage of all the little mistakes opponent make, and, you know, I win the game this way. So, with that game, we'll conclude the part two of the Smith Moore lecture series, and again, hope everyone enjoyed it. Um, we learned a lot of new things this time, and we recapped some things we learned in part one. And now, part three will gonna be uh, basically a lot of much tougher lines, and a lot of good lines for black, where I'm going to show how black sometimes take advantage of the fact that, you know, white is the opponent. I'll show you some games that I lost and some more to very strong players who reacted to it very well. And also, um, and that's basically, and we'll also go over the knight of 6 line, e4, c5, d4, c takes, c3, knight of 6, and see how white can get an advantage there. So hope everyone enjoyed it once again, and my part three will gonna hopefully come up pretty soon as well.